Good afternoon. Happy Monday. As uh, a gift to all of you, I don't have anything at the top, so happy to uh, start with start with your questions. Time will tell. About um, a very general question on U on Ukraine. Sure. What what exactly do you think you accomplished at this uh, Security Council meeting? Well, uh, Matt, you heard from uh, our ambassador to the UN, uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield. She had an opportunity in yeah, the yeah, session. Wait, 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 wait. You don't need to go through everything that she said and everything that everyone. I just what did what 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 does the administration think it accomplished by bringing this to the well, Security Council? Uh, can I give a slight a slight preamble and then well, and then yeah, and then I, I will <laughs> and then I repeat I, everything that was said in an hour I will I meeting. will I will come to your question but okay. I think it is important because not everyone is uh, the 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 famed Matt Lee uh, diplomatic uh, uh, reporter extraordinaire and I think the context here is important uh, because the UN Security Council as we know uh, under the UN Charter has primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. Uh, it takes the lead in determining the existence of a threat to international peace and security uh, and takes the lead in examining instances of aggression. Uh, and that is precisely what uh, we are seeing here. Uh, and you have heard that from us over the past couple months. You've heard that uh, from our allies and partners. You've heard that from uh, members of the Security Council uh, today. Uh, the point today, Matt, to come to your question, uh, was um, to continue to shine a spotlight uh, on what we are seeing uh, and to demonstrate to the international community, to demonstrate to the Russian Federation that uh, the world is uh, united uh, in the viewpoint that uh, aggression violations of a core tenet of the rules-based international order, uh, that these elements uh, must not be allowed to, to be conducted with impunity. Uh, we heard a good deal of consensus from the Security Council. Uh, we heard from uh, many of the speakers today that uh, this situation, the situation and the crisis on the border that uh, Russia has needlessly precipitated uh, should be resolved diplomatically. Uh, that is the point that we have been uh, emphasizing all along. Diplomacy and dialogue remains our uh, preferred course. Uh, but there was a resounding call uh, from the Security Council this morning uh, that Russia should avail itself uh, of that course. Uh, we heard from the Russian Federation, as we've heard uh, from uh, Moscow before, that uh, they have no plans to invade Ukraine. Uh, but as we've consistently said, uh, we'll be looking for deeds. We'll be looking for concrete signs of de-escalation. We and the members of the Security Council uh, will, even as we look for those concrete signs of de-escalation and, and those deeds, uh, we'll hold them to those words. Uh, we're continuing to monitor their actions. Uh, you heard that uh, from us in the, in the Council this morning. Uh, you've heard that from uh, any number of, of allies and partners around the world. So this was uh, the first time, despite dozens and dozens of private engagements, about 180 uh, engagements uh, in, in recent weeks alone, but this was the first time that the Security Council took up this question uh, in an open session, and we thought that was important. Uh, we thought it was important that they do so in that venue uh, and uh, with that level of exposition. Uh, so that the world could hear it uh, and the Russian Federation could hear it. Okay, but I, I just try to, because it, it it sounds like the same thing going back and forth between both sides. And when you say that the Security Council takes the lead in determining the existence of a threat to international peace and security, um, did the Security Council actually do anything? Matt, uh, this was not about uh, a resolution. It was not about a vote. Uh, this was about an exposition of the facts. And hasn't there been an Expositions after expositions after expositions Matt, of this going we, back we are, we are months not, now. We are not you, you, you yourself get up here every single day and talk about, or whenever you get up here, I'm going to say, I mean, just when, when you're briefing, you get up here and you talk about the G7, you talk about the EU, you talk about NATO, you talk about, you know, any, 
any, any, any number of international fora sure. that where this stuff has actually come out and been agreed on. Matt, we are not and going to say, apologize for well, engaging in robust okay. diplomacy, for well, bringing this to every conceivable fora well, you say and you appropriate say, fora, okay, uh, and for continuing to be transparent with our concerns. Okay, well, if, if the criticism is that we are engaging too robustly in diplomacy, that we're being too transparent, that we're being too consistent in what we're saying, I, that is criticism that, that we will accept if okay. that's a criticism you want to lodge. Well, I'm not criticizing at all. I'm just curious as to when you say the world is united in opposing Russian aggression, uh, but and, and, and you say that because of what happened in the Security Council today, then that's just flat wrong because the world isn't united. There were two members of the council that veto uh, wielding members of the council that didn't even want to have this meeting in the first place. Well, so I, I, when, when, when you talk about, when you talk about, I just, I just wonder, what do you think, how do you think you have advanced <clears throat> the cause, or your, 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 your cause, the, the cause of the United States, of Europe, of NATO, encountering Russian aggression with this meeting? So you raised two countries. Uh, I think one country we can explain uh, their. We, you can explain their opposition one of them pretty has easily. Got more, more people in it than uh, the other. The country that is behind uh, this aggression, the country that is behind this buildup, the country that has consistently engaged uh, in disinformation, misinformation, and propaganda in an effort to uh, obfuscate uh, the facts. So uh, we can we can explain that country's vote. Uh, but I assume you're also uh, referring to uh, the PRC. Uh, a couple facts. Uh, one is that the PRC uh, frequently does side and vote with uh, Russia on the Security Council. Uh, that did not come as a surprise. We also understand, I, I think as you alluded to, uh, that their objection today was uh, more of an objection to the format uh, than a dismissal uh, of the subject. Uh, and we know uh, that uh, this is uh, a matter of concern for the PRC. Secretary Blinken uh, discussed it with Foreign Minister Wong when they connected uh, last week. Uh, but I make a couple other points. One, uh, we often hear from the PRC very forceful, um, uh, very forceful uh, 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 support for territorial integrity uh, and the concept of, of sovereignty. Uh, that is a refrain of the PRC in New York. Uh, in Beijing, uh, and around the world. Uh, Can I just uh, ask one thing about that? And when they talk about that, they're talking about Tibet. They're talking about Hong Kong. They're talking these, about these, all, all things that you actually disagree with. These principles, the principle of sovereignty, the principle of territorial integrity, uh, these are principles that are universal. They have uh, universal applicability. Uh, so, so then you, you believe that, 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 that the PRC has territorial and, uh, sovereignty over Hong Kong and Tibet? If, if any country believes in the concept of sovereignty, uh, it this— be, It should be China? Is that what you're saying? Th this is an episode okay. that has the potential to undermine that core tenet, that core tenet of the rules-based international order. Okay. Uh, two— um, there, of course, are a lot of issues where uh, we don't see eye to eye uh, with our uh, PRC counterparts. Uh, but uh, I think where we do see eye to eye, and you saw from the PRC's remarks, uh, their support for diplomacy, for dialogue, their support uh, for a diplomatic resolution, I think it speaks to the fact it is in no one's interest, not in our interest, of course, not in NATO's interest, not in uh, our European allies and partners' interest, uh, and not in the PRC's interest to see a potentially destabilizing conflict uh, emerge in the European con uh, continent. Uh, it would impact the PRC's interests all over uh, the world as well. Uh, so we know uh, how the PRC tends to operate, uh, including in the UN Security Council. Uh, we're clear-eyed uh, about that, but we also know that Russian aggression, a renewed Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, it would be a matter of great import uh, and presumably a, a matter of great con great concern for the PRC as well. Kimara. Um, just following up on sure those. So f after today, do you guys have a concrete plan to keep the Security Council's attention on this issue? Like Russia will hold the presidency in February. 
you guys have any plans to call further meetings on the situation? I'll defer to my colleagues up in New York to speak to the next steps, but I think what you heard from Ambassador Thomas Greenfield today is that she has been intently focused on this, and you heard from her uh, yesterday on television as well. She has been intently focused on this uh, with our allies and partners uh, in New York, but also uh, with the Russian delegation. Uh, in New York. So whether it is within the UN Security Council context, whether it's within the UN uh, context more broadly in New York, uh, the answer to uh, your question, broadly speaking, is yes. Uh, we will continue to keep the focus on this, as I was referring to Matt, uh, across all appropriate fora, uh, the UN being one of them. Okay. I have a couple of other questions. So <laughs> last week, Deputy Secretary Sandy Sherman made a comment about the potential timing of a potential Russian invasion and she was speaking in reference to the Olympics. She said, uh, given the timing and the Olympics starting soon, it, she said President Xi wouldn't be ecstatic if Putin chose to invade. Now, surely you will say, I'm not in Vladimir Putin's brain and I don't speak for him, but certainly the US has an assessment on this. Is it now the US assessment that Putin will wait until after the Olympics? Can you talk a little bit towards that end? I, so there is not much I'm uh, in a position to say here beyond a couple broad points. And you heard this from Secretary Austin. You heard this from Chairman Milley uh, last week. Um, we don't believe uh, that Vladimir Putin has made uh, a firm decision. Uh, the other point uh, is that only one person can make that decision. So uh, if Putin hasn't made a decision, uh, that decision to move forward or not has yet been made. Uh, it is our goal in all of this uh, to attempt to influence uh, Moscow's decision-making and Moscow's calculus, uh, because even as we've made very clear that our preferred course is dialogue and diplomacy, uh, we have continued to make prudent preparations vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other path, uh, and that is defense and deterrence. Uh, and so uh, it is um, up to us and to our partners and, and allies to make very clear uh, the costs that uh, the costs uh, that would befall the Russian Federation if renewed invasion were to go forward. We've been very clear about that. Again, to, to Max, uh, Matt's question, perhaps uh, too clear um, uh, in, the, in the words of some. Uh, but uh, that's what we've been engaged, engaged in all along. Even as we continue to prefer the path of dialogue and, and, uh, def dialogue and diplomacy, uh, we're continuing to, uh, with our partners and allies, uh, prepare with defense and deterrence. Right. And the final thing is about um, just an update, whether you have an update on the number of Americans uh, in Ukraine. Sure. So as you know, and we've discussed uh, this uh, in the context both of uh, Ukraine and, and other countries, but uh, you uh, well know by now that we uh, typically um, uh, don't provide numbers uh, of U.S. citizens living in or traveling to uh, another country. Uh, and we don't do that for all the reasons that are very familiar to you by now. United States citizens are not uh, required to register when they travel overseas. Those that do opt to register, uh, most of them presumably do not deregister uh, when they leave a country. Uh, when it comes to the registration of individuals in our, in our so-called step system, uh, we are also not in a position to uh, verify individuals who sign up. And in fact, we know from previous experiences that international organizations, third country nationals, many people who aren't um, U.S. citizens do sign up for uh, various, uh, various reasons. Uh, now, having said all that, uh, our embassies uh, do compile estimates of U.S. citizens uh, in their countries for time to time for contingency planning purposes. Uh, and as you know, our embassy in Kyiv uh, has been engaged in robust contingency planning together with um, officials here at the department and across the interagency uh, for some time now. Uh, these estimates are based on the best available information specific to that country, um, pulling on all available uh, inputs. But even then, uh, we are not in a position to call any particular figure authoritative uh, or uh, comprehensive. But I will say, uh, that for Ukraine in October, which I'll come to, that's, that's uh, noteworthy, uh, the estimate was that there were 6,600 U.S. citizens residing in Ukraine. Uh, and that is in addition to uh, American tourists uh, and visitors who may have been there uh, at the time. 
Now, we reached that estimate, as I said, based on all of the inputs that were available to us, and that includes data from our Ukrainian government partners, uh, interactions with American organizations in Ukraine, like the Chamber of Commerce, uh, exchange programs and international schools, uh, and the number of people applying for U.S. citizen services, uh, such as passports at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev. Uh, so as you will see, those inputs are instructive, uh, but they are not necessarily dispositive when it comes to uh, a firm, accurate, comprehensive number. But uh, that is the estimate we were able to arrive at last October, 6,600. Now, our embassy also estimated, again, in October, uh, before Russia's military buildup began, uh, that at any given time, any given point in time, there could be 16,000 U.S. citizens, uh, U.S. citizen tourists and visitors in Ukraine. Uh, now, this was back in October. Uh, and ever since, as you know, we have been urging U.S. citizens not to travel to Ukraine. And in fact, uh, those warnings began that very month in October 2021, October of last year. Uh, it was in the first instance a result of uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and uh, epidemiological conditions uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and of course, more recently due to the increased threat from Russia. And so uh, while we uh, estimated at the time there could be 16,000 tourists and visitors, uh, our best assessment uh, is that that number is much, much lower now. Uh, and we do not believe this figure to be an accurate reflection uh, of where we are now since many of those American tourists, many of those visitors uh, presumably would have um, departed the country, uh, never intended to stay more than a few days, a couple weeks, um, or have heeded uh, our concerted messaging, uh, including in we recent weeks, uh, that American citizens uh, should strongly consider departing the country, uh, that they should avail themselves of the plentiful uh, commercial options uh, that are available um, both due to COVID, but of course more recently and more acutely uh, due to the risk of a Russian invasion. Right. One final one for me is like, are you guys doing any, uh, undertaking any effort to reach out to these people, uh, like the 6,600? The answer to that is unequivocally yes. Uh, we have, as a matter of course, uh, this happens all around the world, but especially in places where the situation has the potential to uh, destabilize uh, quite rapidly, which of course is the uh, situation in Ukraine. We have been uh, regularly messaging uh, American citizens, uh, sending out uh, notices, uh, urging them, as we have done in recent days and even in recent hours, uh, to strongly consider availing themselves of uh, the available commercial options and departing the country now. Uh, we have um, been issuing that message uh, for uh, some time now. Uh, we will continue to urge uh, American citizens who, despite months uh, of uh, warnings that Americans should not travel to Ukraine, uh, despite a more recent uh, campaign to educate uh, American citizens who, for um, whatever reason, remain in Ukraine, that they should leave, uh, we will continue to be very clear uh, through every channel we can uh, to convey that message uh, to American citizens, whether it's social media, whether it's on our website, uh, whether it is through engagement with um, uh, reporters like all of you. We have engaged with uh, diaspora uh, reporters uh, as well. Again, uh, availing ourselves of every appropriate channel uh, to convey in strong terms uh, the guidance that Americans should strongly consider uh, leaving Ukraine at this time uh, using available well, options. Right, Matt, Matt, when you talk about 6,600, mm -hmm. does that include U.S. government personnel? Uh, these are private U.S. citizens. Oh, private, right. okay. And then uh, you said that you don't, you think that the number, the 16,000 potentially at any one time would have decreased significantly over the last four months. Do you also think that the 6,600 would have decreased significantly or no? Do you not? So the, the difference between those two numbers is the 16,000 are visitors and tourists. So right. presumably do people- you think that some of this, some are, you know, a, 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 some kind of percentage yeah. of the 6,600 who were living there permanently or, you know, it's residing the, there have also left 
since October? So the short answer is that we, we don't have a way of knowing. Um, but if you uh, take your question on the basis of human nature rather than uh, any sort of consular knowledge, I think the short answer is probably that uh, a greater percentage uh, of the visitors and tourists uh, that were there in October uh, are no longer there, that that 16,000 number is, is lower. Uh, when it comes to the 6,600 figure, uh, again, uh, we don't have perfect insight into it, but many of these individuals are likely to be dual U.S. Ukrainian citizens, uh, many of whom uh, consider Ukraine to be, to be home. Uh, the decision to leave for them uh, may be more difficult than it would be for someone who is there for a, uh, a business opportunity or, or there for tourism purposes, for example. Francesco. So tomorrow you expect that there are meetings with top two uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, could you share your expectation about this call? I know that before previous engagements, you guys have said we're not expecting any breakthrough, uh, but this time uh, you have shared your written response. They have studied it. Everyone knows the other side's concerns, threats, uh, stakes. Uh, so what do you expect tomorrow? Is it a make or break dialogue or is it not? Are you just trying to push the, 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 can, uh, the can of the dialogue down the road to, to earn time? I, I would characterize it uh, as the next step, uh, as the next step uh, in the path of diplomacy and dialogue. And uh, the opportunity for the secretary and foreign minister uh, to speak was something that the two individuals agreed to uh, in Geneva the other week. Uh, during that session, uh, as uh, you later heard from us, uh, we uh, told the Russian Federation that our written response uh, would be forthcoming imminently, uh, and then it was agreed that at a date to be determined, uh, the Foreign Minister and the Secretary of State uh, would have an opportunity to engage. And so uh, that date uh, has now arrived. It will be tomorrow morning. Uh, you have heard from the Kremlin um, what to us is the key fact and the key reaction, and that is that uh, it is and has been uh, on the desk of Vladimir Putin. Uh, and this goes back to Humaira's question. Uh, there is only one individual uh, who, from the Russian side, can determine what Moscow does or does not do. Uh, his reaction, his response, uh, is the response that uh, matters most to us. Uh, we will have to see uh, what uh, the foreign minister has to say in terms of conveying uh, the official position uh, or any initial reactions uh, from the Kremlin to uh, our written response. But that's per uh, precisely why uh, the secretary is uh, engaging uh, in this conversation uh, to hear uh, initial reactions and, again, to share uh, our concerns uh, and to continue discussions uh, around issues where there may be the potential uh, for reciprocal progress, uh, reciprocal in terms of improving um, uh, and addressing uh, the security concerns of the United States, uh, those we share with our European allies uh, and partners, uh, but then, two, uh, determining if there are ways uh, within the Venn diagram of issues that uh, all of us believe may be viable uh, to determine if there are ways to address uh, some of Moscow's stated concerns as well. Precisely, President Macron just talked again today to President Putin, uh, second time in like four days. Isn't it more effective to, to, to just talk to President Putin and skip the the, 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 the other part of the government since you say that he's the only one who can decide? And well, as you know, we haven't shut the door on uh, engagement with uh, President Putin, and quite to the contrary, uh, the President was asked about this at his press conference, and he said he would be amenable uh, to another conversation with uh, President Putin. Um, but uh, we are fortunate uh, to um, have a Secretary of State who is deeply engaged on this, uh, and the next conversation will be at that level. Yes, I just wanted to ask you, if President Zelensky keeps saying that you guys are, you know, exaggerating, and sowing panic and so on. If the uh, Ukrainian ambassador today, Oksana Markrova, said basically the same thing. So why, why all this uh, drumbeat? I mean, if, if, they are, if, they're, if, if the Ukrainians are saying, look, you're exaggerating, there is no imminent war and so on, but you keep saying that it is really imminent, could you at least clarify this discrepancy with I, the economy? Uh, Saeed, you heard from the Ukrainian ambassador uh, yesterday. Uh, the level of coordination uh, between our two countries, uh, the fact that uh, we see 
uh, eye to eye on, on, on many key issues. Our, our point in all of this, and I think this uh, speaks to what we've heard from some of our Ukrainian partners, uh, this is not about panic. To the contrary, this is about prudent preparation. Uh, everything you have heard from us uh, is in the vein of prudent preparation, uh, whether that is in terms of fulfilling the Ukrainian government requests for significant amounts of defensive security assistance, which we've done uh, to the tune of $650 million last year, more than any administration has uh, previously uh, done, uh, whether it is uh, in terms of authorizing, as our Ukrainian partners uh, have applauded uh, other NATO allies to provide U.S. origin equipment uh, to the Ukrainians, whether it is what we have done in the context of uh, NATO, um, both the contingency planning uh, and the pledge to uh, reinforce and reassure NATO's uh, eastern flank. Uh, none of this is in an effort to uh, sow panic, uh, to uh, make an invasion more likely, and to the contrary. All of this uh, is uh, an effort to deter uh, an invasion, and uh, should Vladimir Putin determine to go forward uh, regardless, to ensure that uh, defenses uh, are uh, appropriately uh, reinforced. Have the arms been and the arms equipment to Ukraine, or you already stopped? So we announced a couple weeks ago now that the president in December authorized an additional drawdown of $200 million, several deliveries uh, of that uh, tranche of defensive security assist assistance has been delivered uh, to Ukraine, uh, and there are more deliveries uh, associated with that drawdown that will continue. Yes. Two questions. Yes. Um, on sanctions and on uh, possible new ambassador nomination uh, to Ukraine, uh, would you be able to confirm that uh, Ambassador Bridget Bring is top choice for the nomination to be ambassador to Ukraine? I am not in a position to confirm that. As you know, uh, nominations emanate uh, from the White House, but the Secretary was asked about this uh, when he was in Kyiv uh, the other day, and he did note that uh, we expect a nomination to be forthcoming shortly. Uh, second on, uh, on sanctions, uh, last Friday during the press conference, um, uh, President Zelensky asked publicly uh, why the U.S. and partners are talking about possible sanctions in case Russia invade, uh, why after, why not now, uh, he asked. Would you be able to, uh, to elaborate on that? Uh, sure. So, uh, and this gets to the point I was, I was just making. Uh, our overriding goal in all of this is to uh, resolve uh, this crisis that Moscow has precipitated uh, through dialogue and diplomacy. Our goal is to see to it uh, that we need not uh, enact sanctions because that means that the Russians uh, won't have moved forward uh, with aggression. Our goal here is deterrence. Uh, and a key point in all of this is that uh, our sanctions, any sanctions package, would lose its deterrent effect uh, if it were to be put in place uh, in advance of uh, an invasion, in advance of uh, additional uh, Russian aggression. Uh, that's one point. Uh, number two, uh, we've heard from, uh, we've heard uh, the question as to why we don't be more specific uh, about the sanctions uh, that we are preparing and, and uh, have prepared with our allies and partners. Uh, and that is equally simple. Uh, it is uh, not in our interest to uh, telegraph our moves, to allow the Russian Federation to take steps that would mitigate uh, the impact of these sanctions. Part of the deterrent effect of these uh, sanctions uh, is the fact that we've been very clear that these sanctions will be unprecedented, unprecedented in terms of uh, their scope, in terms of uh, their, their scale, uh, what they are and can inflict on uh, the Russian Federation, uh, that they go after um, uh, sectors that have strategic importance uh, to uh, the Russian Federation. And th these are measures that were intentionally not pursued uh, in 2014 uh, because of their implications uh, on uh, the Russian Federation. So, of course, these are not elements and these are not tools that uh, we take lightly, but this would not be um, anything, uh, further Russian aggression would not be anything that we would seek to discount, uh, that we would seek uh, to minimize. And so that is why you have heard us uh, speak to uh, the strength 
uh, of the sanctions uh, that would befall uh, in, a in a manner that is uh, swift, strong, uh, and sudden. Third point, the, even as we uh, put these measures in place, these measures that are designed to have a deterrent effect, uh, we are moving forward across a range uh, of actions uh, to, uh, in the vein of defense and deterrence. I've already spoken of the defensive security assistance uh, that we are providing to Ukraine, the authorization for third countries to provide um, U.S. origin equipment uh, to Ukraine. We've spoken of uh, the economic uh, assistance and support uh, that we are looking with the support of Congress uh, to provide Ukraine. We've spoken of uh, what we are doing uh, with NATO uh, to uh, reinforce and to reassure uh, NATO's eastern flank. Those are just some of the areas in which uh, well in advance of any potential Russian aggression, uh, be it an invasion uh, or something else from Moscow's playbook, uh, we are moving full speed ahead, uh, full speed ahead to make sure that even as we continue to prefer this course of diplomacy and dialogue, uh, we are ready with a path of defense and deterrence uh, if that's a path we have to go down. One more question on sanctions. You mentioned Congress. There is an effort, a bipartisan effort in Congress to pass a new Russian sanction bill. Um, the only uh, contest contestant issue uh, is, uh, seems like Nord Stream 2, uh, sanctions on Nord Stream 2. Does administration support this effort uh, for new sanctions bill, and do you have any new position on uh, Nord Stream 2? So I will defer to Congress as this specific legislation moves through the process. You heard from Toria Newland yesterday uh, that we've been in regular touch uh, with the Hill um, on uh, this legislation. We continue to be in close touch with them on everything pertaining uh, to, to Russia and Ukraine. Um, but as this legislation moves through the process, I will defer to um, our uh, counterparts on the Hill. And beyond what we've said last week, uh, that in the event of uh, a Russian invasion, uh, Nord Stream 2 won't mo will not move forward one way or another. Uh, that continues to be our position. That will be our position. Uh, yes, John. Today, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield said that uh, the United States believed that Russia moved 5,000 troops into Belarus, and the United States has information and uh, evidence that they believe that Russia is moving 30,000 uh, troops to the Ukrainian border uh, within a matter of days. It said early February. Um, a, a U.S. official has since said that this uh, is, comes from recently declassified U.S. intelligence. Um, can you just get a little bit more information about uh, how the United States knows this without getting into sources and methods? Uh, as you know, the U.S. does not have a flawless record uh, when it comes to giving intelligence at the Security Council. Just wondering if you could uh, give us a little bit more background information on this. So the, the short answer is that I'm not in a position to offer further detail on uh, the information that ha we have released, precisely as you stated, because uh, some of it uh, uh, does come from uh, information that we've been able to uh, appropriately declassify uh, with adequate protection for sources and methods. So uh, the amount of uh, additional detail we can offer uh, is limited. What I will say, though, is that uh, we have, since the earliest days of uh, this crisis that Moscow has needlessly provoked, uh, been uh, extraordinarily transparent. Uh, and I think your question speaks to the fact that uh, we are not, in some ways, following uh, the normal formula uh, in how we talk about these things, because we thought it was important early on uh, to be uh, clear and candid and consistent uh, with the American people, but also with uh, the international community, including our, our allies and partners in Europe, but also the Russian Federation. Uh, to let them know uh, and to leave no uh, mistake uh, that um, uh, we had taken note uh, of what we initially called their uh, unusual military uh, movements and what we have since uh, come to recognize uh, as potential preparations for uh, large-scale action against Ukraine. Uh, the Secretary spoke to this in November. Uh, the concerns uh, that we had at that time. And since then, uh, we have been in a position to release additional uh, detail to expose uh, what the Russians uh, had uh, and are doing. Um, uh, and you've also seen 
our allies and partners uh, do that as well. Uh, our British counterparts, of course, uh, released some information. Uh, the um, uh, that was, was U.S. derived information though that the that the British released. Uh, we have an incredibly close intelligence sharing relationship with the United Kingdom. Uh, it is true that uh, we share uh, an extraordinary amount uh, of information with them, but the, but the British government did release uh, information pointing to uh, uh, what was characterized and what we assess uh, as well uh, to be uh, preparations to install uh, Kremlin loyalists uh, in the event um, uh, that uh, the, uh, in the event of uh, Russian aggression. Uh, so that speaks to the fact that it is not just the United States government uh, sharing these concerns. And we have heard this uh, from other governments that have declassified information, but also uh, from uh, allies and partners around the world uh, that have spoken not always in, the ter in terms of declassified information, um, but in terms that uh, clearly are informed uh, by information that is available to us collectively uh, through all channels, uh, whether that is information that is non-public. Um, but again, John, much of this is information that is uh, crystal clear to the casual observer. Uh, the movement of 100,000 troops, um, the preparations that the Russian Federation is undertaking, uh, you need not be sitting in Langley, Virginia uh, to know the import and to know um, uh, what that uh, what that suggests, uh, and whether it's commercial uh, satellite imagery, uh, whether it is uh, social media, uh, whether it is what the Russian government uh, itself is saying, uh, even as it uh, uh, attempts to explain away uh, the movement of 100,000 troops and tens of thousands of troops uh, into Belarus using whatever explanation is the explanation du jour. Um, these things can't be disguised. These things can't be obfuscated. Uh, and so uh, we are um, going to extraordinary lengths to uh, shine a spotlight on them uh, in the vein, again, uh, of prudent preparation, um, prudent preparation uh, for what we know the Russian Federation has done in the past, including in 2014, uh, and what we are deeply concerned uh, they may uh, seek to do uh, going are, forward. Are you feeling a credibility squeeze at all? Just because obviously you, this is being contested by the Russians, but it, the intelligence is also being questioned by the Ukrainians as well. Uh, so while neither are in Langley, uh, they're clearly on different sides of this conflict. Uh, John, we uh, sh ha are sharing information, sharing intelligence uh, with our Ukrainian partners. Uh, we do that as a routine matter with our European allies as well. Uh, I do not think that aside from a dissonant uh, perspective in Moscow, uh, a perspective that relies uh, on uh, propaganda, uh, disinformation, um, I, aside from that perspective, uh, I don't think you hear um, uh, doubt about what the Russians are capable, capable of and uh, the concern uh, that their military movements have engendered around the world. What's the track record of Langley, Virginia? when you talk about this. I mean, why do you, why, you know, and I would also say what John brings up, you know, the last time the U.S. and the British tag team, uh, tag teamed on an intelligence, uh, intelligence reporting, uh, do you remember? I'm old enough to remember what happened after that. Uh, Matt, if, if. And, and, and so let, go ahead, you can answer that. No, please. I'll go back to Langley, because I'd like to know. I mean, how did, how did they do on predicting, you know, Afghanistan? Uh, and what would happen after the withdrawal of U.S. troops? Uh, Matt, I think uh, you know, uh, I know as someone who used to work there, that yeah. uh, intelligence, uh, it, is, um, uh, it is intelligence analysis. Uh, analysis is based on the best available uh, inputs uh, and the uh, number of challenges that our intelligence community has approached uh, with precision in a way that has allowed policymakers to make informed decisions that have saved American lives, have advanced American interests, have uh, forestalled uh, uh, crises and challenges around the world, uh, they are far greater than the episodes you may be referring to. They're greater to. than the Iraq War, they're greater than, I, than, 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 than what happened I'm, in I'm speaking to uh, greater in terms of uh, the number over time uh, and uh, the totality of the experience uh, both before 2003 and after 2003. I don't speak for uh, any institution but the State Department, but I can say as a historical matter, uh, you have uh, heard from intelligence community leaders and 
uh, American leaders uh, in the ensuing years uh, of um, uh, steps that have uh, taken place and uh, corrective measures uh, that were put into place after 2003. But uh, clearly, Matt, this is not analogous. Uh, and anyone uh, who would uh, seek to claim that uh, clear indications of Russians amassing forces along Ukraine borders, uh, Ukraine's borders, inside Belarus, uh, the disinformation that they're taking part in, uh, their, the own, their own contingency planning that is ongoing now, uh, all of that speaks to uh, the great concern we have. Uh, not only the concern we have, but uh, that our allies and partners around the world share. Understandable, but you know, when you get things so catastrophically wrong in very high profile cases, it, you know, it, it, there's, it stands to reason that people are going to question the analysis, even when there are such obvious signs of something potentially imminent happening. Uh, Matt, I think, you, I think you just said it. There are obvious signs here for concern. Uh, if uh, perhaps you're hearing things I have not, uh, but I have not heard uh, a uh, informed uh, observer or set of observers uh, question why there is a need to be concerned over 100,000 Russian troops uh, encircling Ukraine uh, on from Russia within Belarus uh, for uh, the clear propaganda disinformation that is emanating from Moscow that uh, we have exposed here from the Department of State and the U.S. government uh, has done uh, as well. If anyone uh, not in Moscow wants to offer innocuous explanations for all of this, ignoring the history, ignoring uh, what we're seeing with our own very eyes, uh, I think that would be a very difficult, uh, difficult argument to make. Uh, uh, Jenny. Conversations with Minsk over this buildup in, in Belarus, and I know you said last week that if an invasion was launched from Belarus, there would be consequences for the Belarusian government. But le what leverage do you actually have, given Lukashenko has not been deterred by any sanctions that we've seen even in the past year? Well, we have been uh, very clear, including to uh, Belarusian authorities directly, uh, that if it allows its territory to be used for an attack on Ukraine, uh, it would face a swift and decisive uh, response from the United States uh, and our allies and partners. Uh, you're right that the regime in Minsk is subject already uh, to U.S. and uh, international sanctions, uh, but this would be um, of a categorically uh, different question. Um, and we've spoken of uh, the unprecedented nature of uh, sanctions and other economic measures that would befall the Russian Federation in the event uh, of an invasion. Uh, were Belarus uh, what should be a sovereign independent country, if that country were to uh, support uh, such an invasion, uh, our response uh, would also be uh, swift and decisive. And is there an active diplomatic channel between state and Minsk or with the embassy there? We still, we still have an embassy there. Uh, we have uh, diplomats who are stationed there. We have um, Ambassador Julie Fisher, uh, Julie Fisher, who's in Vilnius, so uh, we are still uh, engaged diplomatically. reports over the weekend, including today from a particular division within Russia's armed forces, that some troops have pulled back from the border areas, a couple of thousand, uh, according to the southern division. Have you seen any indications that some troops have actually departed? Uh, I'm not immediately familiar with those reports. If we have anything to add on those reports, uh, we will let you know. But I will say, uh, and you heard this again from Tori Newland yesterday, uh, we have consistently called for de-escalation, for genuine indications of de-escalation. Uh, and we have, uh, broadly speaking, not seen that. Uh, Said. Sure. Thank you. Uh, first of all, there was a call today between uh, Secretary Blinken and PA President Mahmoud Abbas. Can you confirm that the Palestinians are saying that they discussed, the, among many issues, the issue of the, the consulate and the reopening of the consulate? Could you confirm that to us? And then I have a couple of other I questions. can confirm that the Secretary did have a call uh, earlier today with uh, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. I, as you know, Saeed, uh, we have prioritized re-engagement uh, with the Palestinian people and Palestinian Authority. Uh, this was an opportunity for the Secretary, who's spoken to President Abbas on a number of occasions already, uh, to continue uh, those conversations. Uh, we'll have a, a, a written readout, um, but 
there was a discussion of uh, the broad relationship uh, as well as the need to improve uh, quality of life for the Palestinian people uh, in tangible ways, something that the United States and our international partners uh, have supported in different ways. Uh, they also discussed the need for uh, reform uh, within uh, the Palestinian uh, Authority, and uh, Secretary Blinken made, made the point that uh, he consistently has, and the point that really uh, undergirds um, our approach here. Uh, that um, our belief that Israelis and Palestinians alike uh, deserve uh, to live uh, with equal measures of uh, security, freedom, prosperity, uh, and crucially dignity. Uh, and that has really been at the center uh, of, of our approach um, uh, to the challenge. Is that what I said to be that? That's come up. So it, may, it may sound similar to that. Yeah, okay, but, in, but on the consular question, that didn't come up? I just don't have anything to add. All right. Uh, by the way, uh, there was uh, uh, Amnesty International uh, said that they are issuing a report tomorrow, a 212-page report that calls Israel an apartheid state and so on. Do you have any comment on that very quickly? Have you, have you read the report? Have you seen it? Have you seen synopsis of it? I, I understand, as you indicated, that the report has not been released, so we'll reserve uh, official comments until we have an opportunity to see it. But as you know, Saeed, that is not language uh, that we have used, nor would we ever use. If you allow me, I'm sorry, uh, and uh, you know, I appreciate the indulgence of my colleagues. Um, Israel is set to destroy a Palestinian uh, neighborhood uh, uh, reservoir that they use for drinking water. Uh, are you aware of this issue? Would you call on the Israelis to sort of, you know, uh, to, to step back from uh, such a decision? We are aware of the issue. Uh, you have heard us say, and it applies equally here. Uh, that we believe it is Israel uh, critical for Israel and the PA to refrain from unilateral steps that exacerbate uh, tensions and undercut efforts to advance a two-state solution. And my final uh, question, I'm sorry, but just uh, on, on uh, the American citizen, uh, Omar uh, Assad, who, you know, uh, died in Israeli custody. Today they turned in the report, I believe. Have, did they share it with you? Did they sh share the findings with you? Uh, and do you have any comment? Are you asking for to conduct your own investigation into it? So as of earlier today, we uh, had not yet seen a final report from the Israeli government. Uh, you have heard me say this uh, before, but we continue to support uh, an investigation that uh, is thorough and comprehensive into the circumstances of the incident, uh, and we welcome receiving additional information as soon uh, as, uh, as soon as possible. Can you, can you confirm if you've gotten a letter Uh, I, I will need to check on that. Because he was a resident of when he was in the States, resident of Wisconsin. I'll, I'll check on that. Yes. I have a couple of uh, sure. questions. The, uh, President Biden uh, just announced that he will notify Congress of his intent to uh, designate Qatar as a major non-NATO ally. What's the importance uh, of this? And is Qatar playing any role uh, with Iran to free the American hostage, hostages uh, there or in bridging uh, the, the gap between the two countries to rejoin the JCPOA? Uh, so on your question, the uh, announcement that you referenced takes place in the context of the visit uh, of the Emir uh, to uh, the White House. Um, this visit makes the Emir uh, the first head of state to visit uh, in this calendar year, in 2022. Uh, and the first Gulf leader uh, to visit Washington uh, during this administration. I think that speaks to uh, the bond we have uh, with Qatar. With Qatar. Uh, it is a relationship uh, that has never been stronger, thanks in large part uh, to our extraordinary partnership across uh, any number of challenges. And uh, late last year, we spent a great deal of time, including from this podium, speaking to the partnership and cooperation we have with Qatar uh, and we still have with Qatar in the context of Afghanistan and Qatar's extraordinary support uh, hosting um, uh, individuals um, who had been evacuated from uh, Afghanistan and still continuing to play uh, an important role in our ongoing efforts to relocate uh, individuals from Afghanistan, uh, whether they're uh, American citizens, uh, U.S. citizens, whether they're lawful permanent residents, uh, or whether uh, they are uh, Afghans uh, to whom we have a special uh, commitment. Uh, of course, the relationship extends uh, well beyond, including in the security realm, which uh, speaks to uh, the announcement uh, that 
uh, you just uh, you just referenced. When it comes to Iran, uh, I don't have anything to add in terms of uh, a, a role, uh, a Qatari role uh, there, uh, beyond stating what you've heard from us before, and that is uh, the release of the Americans and third country nationals uh, who are being unjustly detained in Iran uh, is a top priority uh, for the United States. Uh, it is a priority that we raise uh, in no uncertain terms at every possible uh, opportunity. It's something that uh, Special Envoy Mali, Ambassador Carson's, uh, their full teams uh, are, are focused on uh, as we uh, continue uh, negotiations in Vienna uh, with the JCPOA. And the uh, Omani Foreign Minister has visited uh, Syria today. Do you have anything on this? Uh, I don't have uh, anything specific on that. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Michelle, our, um, uh, where we fall in terms of uh, the Assad regime uh, and uh, the atrocities that uh, the regime has perpetrated against its own people. Uh, we continue to believe that uh, now is not the time for uh, normalization uh, now continues to be the time uh, for accountability uh, for the atrocities of the regime. And my last one on uh, Lebanon, the United States, as the uh, uh, report said, plans to reroute $67 million of military assistance for uh, Lebanon's armed forces to support uh, members of the military. And you, know, uh, you uh, sent a notification to, to the Congress. Is it accurate? And do you have anything uh, on this? I can confirm that w the administration has notified Congress uh, of the intent to provide additional support uh, for the Lebanese Armed Forces uh, as they respond to a wide range of security, economic, uh, and public health challenges uh, currently uh, facing the country. Uh, we want to ensure that the Lebanese Armed Forces is able to carry out its duties and functions, uh, including uh, the ability to defend Lebanon's territorial integrity, provide uh, internal security, and preserve uh, stability. Since 2006, U.S. investments of more than $2.5 billion in the Lebanese Armed Forces have enabled uh, the Lebanese military to uh, contribute to the degradation uh, of the uh, of ISIS in Lebanon to carry out operations against Al Qaeda uh, and to expand control over Lebanese territory along its border with Syria. Uh, over the last two years, moreover, uh, the Lebanese armed forces uh, have also been at the forefront of responding to the various crises that are affecting the state of Lebanon and the, the Lebanese people, uh, as demonstrated in, in its support of a, the emergency response uh, to the Beirut port blast in August. Uh, of 2020 and, of course, uh, to its response to uh, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic in Lebanon as Can well. Can you be a little bit more specific? How much additional assistance is going to the Lebanese military? We're because my understanding of it is that you're moving $67 million from the military to the military. Well, it's not additional. It's not it's additional. Massive. And, in fact, it, 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 it really means kind of nothing because it's going to – you're just <laughs> – well – we're, con we're con I'm not in a position to provide additional details at this time. We're continuing to have consultations uh, with the Hill on this, but yeah. uh, as soon as we have more additional uh, details one provided, more we'll that, more, One more in that region. I know that you tweeted about this last night, mm -hmm. but I just, you know, in terms of this, uh, uh, the Houthi uh, missile, uh, attempted mm -hmm. missile attack on, uh, on the UAE, uh, one, do you, do you have any reason to believe that it was specifically timed to the visit of the um, Israeli uh, president? And uh, secondly, you know, what, what is it going to take for you guys to uh, step up uh, your pressure uh, uh, on the Houthis? And, and I'm not just talking about with a paper designation of a, uh, an FTO designation, but, uh, you know, what do they have to do before you realize that, um, or before you, before you take action, significant action, uh, against them? And their pro and the people who they are serve as proxies for. Well, I, I would be interested in hearing your, your definition of significant action and how that compares to uh, the actions that we've consistently taken in terms of designations, in, term of, in terms of interdictions, in terms of uh, working with the international community uh, to uh, shine a spotlight on uh, the Houthis' uh, conduct, uh, to uh, 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 ensure accountability um, for uh, their continued attacks, uh, including their continued attacks against our partners in the region, that includes Saudi Arabia, but also the UAE, and you referenced uh, the uh, attack over the weekend. Uh, in terms of motivation, uh, I can't 
point to a motivation specifically beyond the fact that, of course, this is not the first time uh, that the UAE in Abu Dhabi uh, has endured an attempted Houthi uh, attack. Um, uh, this is a challenge that uh, we are very focused on. Uh, we're very focused on it in terms of uh, s providing uh, support that our partners, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, need to defend themselves uh, against these types of terrorist attacks, um, but also uh, pursuing uh, those Houthi leaders with appropriate uh, authorities and tools uh, that um, will hold them accountable, will constrain their ability uh, to engage in this type of reprehensible uh, behavior, and that even as we do all that, uh, seeking with the Saudis, uh, with uh, other regional partners, of course, with the UN Special Envoy, uh, to find uh, a diplomatic solution to uh, the conflict in Yemen. This is a conflict that the Houthis have been able to leverage uh, to their advantage. Uh, and the sooner we can find uh, a means by which to uh, bring about a diplomatic solution uh, here in Yemen, uh, we will be better positioned uh, across across all these challenges. Why do you think the Houthis have managed to leverage it to their advantage? Well, the, the vacuum uh, that has existed, the power vacuum that in some ways has existed uh, in Yemen since um, 2015 uh, has... Do you, do you think that U.S. policy has played any role in, the, in, in what you're saying now, is that, the, the, I, that this is a conflict that the Houthis have managed to leverage to their advantage? What I can tell you is that U.S. policy now is focused on finding a diplomatic solution uh, to this, uh, not only to bring about greater levels of stability and security in Yemen, uh, but also to put an end to uh, or to alleviate uh, the humanitarian emergency that is afflicting uh, millions of Yemenis, 16 million Yemenis, uh, I believe, uh, are suffering from food insecurity at the moment. Uh, part of that is due to long-standing uh, factors, but part of that is due to uh, what we are seeing on the ground in terms of these uh, Houthi offenses. So for us, this is a question of international peace and security. Uh, it's a question of grave humanitarian concern, uh, and it's a question that we're intently focused on diplomatically. On the list of we, we discussed it last week. The, uh, we discussed it in this room, I should say, last week. Uh, the, the president uh, has noted that um, uh, it is a, a tool that is under review. Uh, I don't have any uh, update to, uh, to, to add to that. Uh, very quick final question, Connor. Sure. We get North Korea launched its longest range ballistic missile since 2017. With each launch that we've seen this year, the seventh now, you guys have issued the same statement condemning it, calling them to talk saying that you're, you know, ironclad with your allies. Are you increasingly alarmed at all about these, this spate of, of missile launches now? Well, uh, we've made no secret about our concern, uh, the concern that uh, we have for uh, what we've seen emanate uh, from uh, the DPRK. It's a concern we share with our allies in the Indo-Pacific, Japan and, and South Korea, in addition to our allies uh, and partners around the globe. Um, of course, the DPRK's ballistic missile and nuclear weapons program. This is a challenge that uh, is longstanding. It is a challenge that has ve vexed um, successive uh, administrations. Uh, we have developed an approach that uh, at its center um, seeks to find uh, a diplomatic means by which to achieve the complete denuclearization uh, of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, it's a challenge and an approach that we continue to uh, speak uh, about with our uh, allies, including especially our allies uh, in uh, the region, but even as uh, we seek to find ways uh, to address this challenge diplomatically, we're moving forward with uh, different steps to hold um, uh, the DPRK uh, responsible and accountable. And this month uh, alone, we imposed sanctions on eight DPRK-linked individuals and entities. Uh, these are individuals and entities that supported the DPRK is weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile related programs. Uh, we are continuing to discuss uh, this challenge uh, in uh, the UN as well. One last one, then on Burkina Faso, we're a week out um, from the military season power. Would you now, at this point in time, call it a coup? And if not, why not? Uh, is a coup assessment underway? Uh, well, um, we are evaluating the impact of these actions on our engagement uh, with, uh, and our engagement in the country, and our engagement with. Uh, authorities in Burkina Faso. Um, it's too soon for us to get into uh, the specifics of that, but we have called for restraint by all actors as we carefully review the events on the ground for uh, any potential impact on our assistance. What I can say now uh, is that we have paused most assistance for the government of Burkina Faso as we continue to monitor the situation.
Thank you all very much.